So, uh, our next speaker is David Manning. Um, and you're all going to stop talking. Okay, actually, you know what we're going to do? Cascadia JS 2014, yeah! There you go. All right. Uh, so David Manning has traveled a long, long way. He's come all the way from Portland, Oregon um, to come speak with us uh, here. And he's going to answer a question that I ask myself every day, which is, can sacrificing a chicken on the first full moon of spring actually improve gar garbage collection cycles? Uh, so give David a hand. Hi, everybody. How you doing? It's four o'clock in the afternoon and you all just ate donuts. It's a pretty great time slot. So yeah, um, my name's David. I do not work for the Somali pirates, despite what you may have heard. Um, <clears throat> also, someone started a rumor that I'm doing web development for the Russian government. Um, let me just go on record and deny that right now. Um, I'm not involved with Vladimir Putin in any way, and I categorically deny anything that you may have heard along those lines. Um, again, yeah, I'm David, and I'm going to talk about practical performance optimization for V8, whatever that means. Um, but if this starts to go south, I am going to fall back on observational humor. <laughs> and dancing cat gifts. Yeah, we can all get behind that, right? So... Um, what are the goals here? Um, so about a year ago, I heard a talk at NodePDX given by Forrest Norville. Hi, Forrest. And Forrest at the time had spent about the last year or so of his life um, instrumenting all of our code for New Relic's user agent. And I think it's safe to say he was in a pretty bad place as a result. And um, he, he talked about a lot of the things that we do badly that, you know, we, the way that we shoot ourselves in the foot writing JavaScript. Um, and some of the things that he said really made me sad because, it, it, I mean, and a, a very simplistic and, uh, and probably wrong version of his, of his talk was, well, you know, try to write JavaScript like it's C++-ish. Um, you know, I mean, again, that's probably not what he said, but it's what I heard at the time. And also he said, don't use closures because they're bad, um, and they'll slow your code down. So all that made me really, really sad, and I thought, really, can, can we not write JavaScript? Do we have to try and write, you know, uh, C++? So, and that's what got me interested in JavaScript performance, and I wanted to find out a little bit more about um, what are the factors involved in making our code fast on JavaScript. So. Um, <laughs> In general, here, here's where I'm coming from with this. Time we spend thinking about optimization is time that we're not thinking about whatever problem we're trying to solve. Um, unless, of course, you're an optimization engineer. In that case, it's different. But in general, it's not what you're doing. Uh, optimization is extra mental load that you have to carry around on top of that. So we don't want to spend our time obsessively thinking about how to optimize our code. So what can we do? It would be nice if we could develop a practice to help us avoid common pitfalls, right? That would be great. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, we don't want our practice to devolve into sort of a, a cargo cult mentality or just a list of do this, don't do that. Um, you know, always use for loops, never use for each. Don't use bind because it's slow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can we, can we do a little bit better than that? Um, can we find a midpoint between superstition and enlightenment? That's what life's all about, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, let's talk a little, I'm fine. Um, let, do I sound hoarse? Honest, honest. Oh, okay. Do you, want, do you want to do your pterodactyl yell? Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> so, um, what is v for, if, if you don't know, some of you obviously will know most of these things, some of you won't, whatever. Um, so, what does V8 compilation look like? How does that work? Um, so, V8 basically uses a two-step process when it compiles your code. Um, and the first step is called full code gen, or it's just the full compiler. It runs right away, it's very fast. Um, and it has to quickly turn your code into something that can be executed. It does not do very much optimization, okay? And it runs on everything. It runs on everything lazily, right? It doesn't do it right away. Um, but as your code executes, as your functions execute, full code gen will produce um, code that can run. And then as time goes by, um, full code gen, well, V8 will observe your code and it will identify the parts of your code that are hot, um, that are getting run a lot. And it will turn loose the, optimi the optimizing compiler called crankshaft on your hot code. And crankshaft is the magic spooky part of V8, okay? It's where all of the, uh, the um, fairies and um, gnomes and, you know, Smurfs probably live. Um, so it's very fancy. It does produce optim it does optimize, and I see that part of this was cut off. It operates on a it operates on a subsection of your code. Okay, it doesn't. It does all of your code does not get optimized, and this is important to realize. Um, only hot code is going to be optimized, which is another reason why you don't want to worry about optimization prematurely. Optimizing compilers not even going to run on everything. Okay, so we, you worry about optimizing hot code paths just like V8 does. Um, here's kind of a diagram that, to explain how the process works. It's not a one-way process. It's not just a straight shot from unoptimized to optimized code. It's a, it's a, it's a relationship. It's a system. Um, we have an unoptimized state and an optimized state, and um, we can move from optimized, or from unoptimized to optimized, and from optimized back to deoptimized state. And we'll talk about what provokes those deoptimization events. Additionally, um, it's possible for your state, for your code to reach a state of being permanently deoptimized, and that's very sad if that happens. We want to avoid that, yes? Um, there are two routes to permanent deoptimization. One is to have code that is simply unoptimizable. Um, for example, at the moment, um, any code with try catch blocks in it is not optimizable. So if you have a function that has a try catch block, that code simply will never be optimized. It will reside here forever without hope. Okay. Um, on the other hand, um, if you go through too many optimization deoptimization cycles, um, V8 will eventually get tired of you, and it will send you down to the permanently deoptimized state. So either of those, those are two ways that you can reach the permanently deoptimized state. You don't want to do that because obviously optimization is better. That's what the word means. <laughs> so how does V8 decide to optimize your code? Well, here are a few of the criteria that it uses. Number one, function length. Yeah, just not, not function dot length, no, function length. Actually, like the length of the function, okay? It optimizes short functions, okay? If, you're, if your deal is like you really love functions that are 300 lines long, no. Okay, keep your functions short. Uh, V8 optimizes short functions. Um, the hotness of code. Hmm. Uh, as I was saying, um, <laughs> optimizing compiler runs on hot code. Okay, um, code pads that are used a lot. Um, so, code that runs one time when your user clicks a button does not really, you probably don't need to worry about that so much. Okay, we're talking about the, place, the places where your process is spending most of its time. Um, yeah. Okay, inline caches. This is kind of a computer science-y thing, okay? Um, inline caches. Um, an inline cache is the saved result of a, pre a previous operation, okay? Um, when the compiler runs down through your code the first time, it caches things like property value lookups and method lookups so that it doesn't have to do it again because that's slow. Um, it keeps track of that 
um, those previous results, and if those don't change, the optimizing compiler uses that accumulated information to produce, to produce its optimization, okay? Well, so uh, the moral of that story we'll get back to in a minute, but basically um, write uh, monomorphic code and don't be passing lots of different kinds of things all the time. Um, I'll come back to that. And finally, hidden classes. Um, hidden classes. Now, Raise your hand if you've heard of JavaScript's hidden classes before. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, wait, wait, so if not, you're, maybe you're wondering what, JavaScript has classes? Yeah, well, no, JavaScript doesn't. Um, but implementations of JavaScript do. Um, so underneath the hood, every time an object is created, V8 assigns an object type to that object. Okay, it gets a hidden class. That class is used as static type information, okay? Um, the optimizing compiler will use the object's hidden class to figure out what kind of optimized code can run on a particular object, okay? The hidden classes need to match. Now, the, 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 the thing is, the hidden classes can change, and we're gonna talk about how. If your hidden classes change all the time, then V8 can't use the optimized segments of code on the new hidden class, the old optimized code gets thrown out and it has to do the whole thing over again. So um, let's go a little bit more into hidden classes and see how those work and how they can change. So here's a cat. Um, I have a cat constructor um, and the cat constructor sets c uh, color and fur length, I guess, yeah. So I'm gonna create two cats. I create two cats, Tully and Scotch. One is a gray cat with long hair and the other is an orange cat with short hair. But both having been created by the same constructor function, they share the same hidden class. Look at them, they're so cute. I said look at them. Okay. Um, that means Tully and Scotch can be passed to the same function, the same optimized code that's designed to work on the cat class can accept both Tully and Scotch. Now, how can that get messed up? Um, well, if I assign a new property to Tully after I've created the object initially, then Tully will get a new hidden class with that new property now a part of it. So having set Tully.birthday as April 1st, now Tully has a new hidden class. Tully is no longer the same hidden class as Scotch. You see, you can, the picture, right, the lion now. It's a different, yeah, it's taxonomy. Um, yeah. So simply adding a new property creates a new hidden class. Um, now I know what you're thinking. Um, you, you could now add the same birthday property to Scotch and then yes, yeah, Scotch would have the same class, but let me explain to you why it's not really the best idea to just be adding properties willy-nilly. Willy-nilly, I should do. Um, so let's say that we append, uh, we create Tully, we create Scotch, and we, cre we, add, we give Tully uh, two new properties, birthday and April 1st, sex, male. So now we give Scotch the property sex and male, and then birthday, May 10th. So they've got the same properties, but we add them in different order. Because we add the properties in different order, they're going to end up with two different hidden classes. The order in which they're uh, added actually does matter. Uh, because the new classes are created, you can imagine a tree. I probably should have had a tree diagram on here, but you can imagine a tree branching off, okay? So this becomes cat birthday, and then we append the sex property, okay? But here we first append the sex property and then the birthday. We end up with two different hidden classes. So the order in which the hidden classes are created actually does matter. Um, so hidden classes are somewhat fragile things. What you want to do to prevent um, messing up is have a constructor function and set all of your properties in the constructor function. Um, and then if you must add properties later, try to do it soon after the object is originally created for some value of soon. In other words, don't just throughout your program when random events happen be adding properties onto objects just like a crazy person because that's going to trigger the optimization events. Cool? I mean, well, obviously you're not because it's really hot in here, but. 
Okay, um, let's talk about allocations and reallocations. When you create a new object, of course JavaScript doesn't have types, but, job, but V8 would really like it to. Um, in order to produce some code, V8 makes certain assumptions about the objects that you've just created. If you create a numeric value that's, you know, small enough to be represented by a 31-bit signed integer, and, you know, doesn't have decimals, then V8 will internally allocate a 31-bit signed integer for that. Um, even though that's not something that's, that's not something that JavaScript differentiates between, but V8 does. If you create a new empty array, by default that array is going to contain space for four of those 31-bit integers. That's the default. And if you later change that to something else, then the old space has to be deallocated and new space reallocated for, what, for the new thing that you're going to put in there. So you declare your array up front um, in line so that you don't have excessive reallocations. This next one's weird, and I'm going to show you an example of this in just a second. Objects, when they're created, a new object is, is created, it's assumed to have one property. At least it's assumed, it, it makes space within the actual allocation of the object for only one property. I'm going to get back around to that and talk about that more at length. That's kind of an a big deal. And finally, um, for those of you who are in the habit of not initializing values at all, realize that while it's true that unassigned values in JavaScript can be automatically typecast to falsy values like zero or, you know, false, um, there's a price um, that, we, that you might pay for that convenience. Let, let's, um, let's see that first. So here's an uninitialized variable in a loop. Okay, um, sorry about the immediately invoked uh, function expression, uh, Chris. Um, but um, here's, here's an uh, initialized variable in a loop. We're just declaring x but not setting it to anything. And then we're going to iterate through 10 times and we're going to add some stuff, add 1 to x every time. That seems great. And we're going to do that, oh, what is that, 100 million times? Great. Um, how long will that take? Seven seconds. Is that, that seems kind of like a long time, I guess. Um, well, what if instead we make a simple change and just allocate that value to zero? Um, then the time goes from seven seconds to 3.6, okay? Simply not allocating that value doubled the amount of time that loop took. And the reason why is because on each pass through the loop, um, the outer loop, that is, JavaScript had to stop and reallocate nothing to a zero before proceeding. And that allocation um, cost you. So, you know, initialize your variables. That doesn't take a lot. Just initialize your variables. Okay? <clears throat> what about object initialization? This is wacky. Okay, so some, same uh, generic structure here. We're going to create um, a new object, and we're going to then add A and B to it, and then a third property C, which is the sum of A and B, which gets nicely cut down the middle there. Um, okay, so just doing that takes us two seconds. Is that good or bad? Well, it's hard to say until we compare it to something else. Um, here's a hint. It's the before example. If we do it with constructor function instead, um, it takes one-tenth the time. That's a big difference, right? Now, some of you are thinking, wait, what if I, what if instead of adding those properties after the fact, what if I was a clever person and I declared them in line in the, in the object literal, right? Um, the answer is it's still bad, <laughs> unfortunately, um, because uh, that's actually, that, declaring these in line, is actually just a sugar syntax for doing this, more or less. There's a lot of complexity in the optimizing compiler, but um, it's, so yeah, even if you declare those within the object literal, it's still going to be really bad. So, um, if you use a constructor, this enables, uh, VA is specifically optimized to scan the constructor function, and upon the first allocation of the object, it's able to make space just for these properties, okay? It's a specific optimization that uh, is, is um, invoked when you call a constructor function through new, and that's just the way that it is. Um, those of you who 
are really anti-new, I, I am sorry. Okay, um, but that, that's the way that it is right now. However, this isn't the category of things that are arbitrary. Okay, there isn't any reason it has to be this way. It's just that new is optimized and object.create isn't. So, um, from those points, here's the main idea. Um, so create objects using new and set your properties in the constructor function. Don't mutate your objects later into the game. If, you're, if, you have, if, you're pro if your object property has to change, make sure that it happens soon after its creation and not at some arbitrary time later. And favor monomorphic functions over polymorphic functions because they are easier to uh, optimize and inline. Now, um, getting back to this, uh, speaking of function inlining, um, I want to talk about this as one last uh, optimization. Um, if you don't know what function inlining is, it's when a function call is swapped out with code that right there in line. Um, the, the code, you can think of it as the code block of the function call being replaced with just the, um, or replacing the function call itself. Now that's good because function calls always come with overhead. When a function is called out, um, memory has to be allocated for context for that function. Um, usually a, a, a jump has to happen within the code to someplace else in the code. Um, stuff has to happen, function calls are relatively expensive. And so if you can replace the function call with something happening in line, that's good. Um, and here's an example of me inlining something in JavaScript. Okay, <clears throat> so as I was saying, when you, create a, when you do create a function, um, a special object called a context is also created, and that function's enclosing scope is contained within that special context. This is how closures work, okay? Um, the, the variables within the outer closure of the function are bound within the special context option, um, object, and that's how, we get, that's how we have lovely closures. Now, currently, and when I say currently, I mean um, versions of V8 that are already outdated but are still present in Node.10. Um, if you use a closure structure like this, um, because, this because invoking values within the closure involves changing out the operating context of the code, that it has to read into that closure's internal context, and that's called a context change, um, that cannot be inlined in older versions of V8. And if you're writing Node, which if you're not, why aren't you? But um, if you're writing Node, uh, Node.10 still uses that older version of V8. So if you run this code with using a closure uh, in Node.10, um, you'll get, it, it takes this long, 0.86 seconds. If you change it to, if, but if you run the same thing in uh, using uh, object prototype structure, the same operation takes um, about a tenth of the time. And that's very sad, and this was, this was the problem, our closure's bad, that initially provoked me to um, start working on this talk. Um, I am happy to say that uh, in the newer versions of V8, closures are now inlined. Okay, so we don't, we don't lose speed when using a structure like this. Uh, the context change involved in invoking a closure um, can be inlined with your code and you don't lose that optimization. So in, if you run this same code, um, which I would do if I weren't at my time limit, uh, if you run this same code at node 11, in like node 11, 13, um, they'll run at roughly the same speed, which is great. Um, and the same thing is true in um, current versions of Chrome, of course. So, okay, moral of the story, I guess. Um, some of these optimi some optimization patterns that, uh, we've talked about here are based on like kind of permanent, eh, well-established principles of compiler optimization. Um, and so you should probably spend some time trying to understand those. Um, there are principles uh, at work in writing a JIT compiler that will, are true basically of all JavaScript compilers. 
Um, so pretty much every JavaScript compiler, for example, uses a multi-stage compilation process, um, just like V8 does. Um, pretty much all implement some versions of inline caches and hidden classes. Okay, so things like that are worth you taking the time to research and understand. Other optimizations are really just rooted in the mindset or approach of the compiler team. So that's why, for example, um, the, uh, creating new objects through new is optimized and using object.create isn't. And some are just arbitrary. Um, they just haven't been optimized yet because maybe the problem is too hard or the pressure doesn't exist to make it happen. And you should complain about those. Um, so for example, promises just got added to V8, but they're, they're still slower than non-native implementations of the same. Go bother people about that. There's no reason that can't be faster. Um, that's all. <laughs>